Hi everyone, welcome to Commissioner Wilson's virtual office hour. She let me go on a little off-roading tour over at the Orange County UF Extension office and I have the honor of interviewing someone about chickens. Welcome, James Yarborough of the Extension office. How are you? I'm doing well, Lee. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Every week we do virtual office hours on the couch in our District 1 office and once in a while it's really awesome when something you know is coming down the line and we want to educate people about it, we'll go and actually interview people in the community about what they do. And um, people have been emailing our office, district1 at ocfl.net, pretty frequently about chickens. Backyard chickens within unincorporated Orange County as of right now, Winter Garden, Maitland, the city of Orlando, and Winter Garden have ordinances for backyard chickens, but not Orange County at large. So these conversations are coming up, and I thought, let's hear some of the facts, and that's why you're here today. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we're actually at the UF Extension office right now. And so once in a while, you're gonna hear some phones ringing, and you're gonna hear some planes going overhead, just we'll power through it and then we're going to get straight into the chickens all right so please go ahead let us know about you and who you are and you know where you're from okay well thank you lee uh, my name is jk albro i'm the uf ifis livestock and natural resources extension agent for orange and seminole counties so what that essentially means is that my job is to help the counties of orange and seminole with any livestock or natural resource issues and I can help them with I take whatever resources I have available to me through the university and I try to extend them out to the people in the community. So yeah, that's, that's, kind of, awesome. that's what I do here. Awesome. Well thank you. Maybe talk a little bit about UF IFIS. Like what is this facility? Why are they in different counties and what what do they represent for the community? Right, so for that it goes all the way back to uh, actually the Civil War during 1862. President Abraham Lincoln signed into uh, act the Morrell Act, which enabled land grant universities. So each state had a land grant university. So that university got a tract of land from the federal government that they could use as they saw fit. So in some cases, in many cases, it was used for uh, agricultural research because that's what was really pressing at the time. And so some of those uh, universities, uh, like the University of Florida. Uh, were creating a lot of great education and research, but we saw that it wasn't going very far past campus. And so to try to uh, amend that, in 1914, we passed the Smith Lever Act, and that allowed extension services to be created and with the intent of being able to take that education from campus and extend it out to the people within the state. So here in the state of Florida, our land grant university is University of Florida, and our extension program works with University of Florida and uh, Florida a and as well. And so together, we have an extension program that has an extension office in each of our 67 counties. And in those offices, we house agents who specialize in a multitude of things like livestock and natural resources, uh, general agriculture, uh, residential horticulture, commercial horticulture, order friendly landscaping, family consumer uh, science, uh, just a multitude of things. Like the National Garden Volunteer Court uh, Program, just a whole bunch of things that these agents specialize in and help the community with. Okay, awesome, thank you. So I see that you're wearing a Gators hat and that's okay. Um, maybe, go UCS, um, go next. Um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about you and what made you passionate and want to join the UF IFIS team. So uh, I grew up actually in Seminole County in Geneva, Geneva, Florida. And uh, I grew up on my family's uh, cow-calf operation, Bee Cattle Ranch, and I'm the fifth generation to work on that ranch. So it's been around for a little while. So I grew up, uh, riding horses and working cattle and being out in the woods and things like that. Um, so I was just familiar with that lifestyle. And so I, when I chose what college to go to, I did my first two years up at a college in Dipton, Georgia called ABAC, Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. And I transferred to UF because I always wanted to be a Gator. Um, you could say that I was brainwashed maybe from a young age. My mom went to UF, um, but actually I'm the, as it turns out, fourth generation in my mom's side of the family tree. I've been to UF. Actually, uh, we found a certificate when uh, my grandmother passed away with cleaning out her stuff and we found a certificate or a degree that her aunt actually had in 1942. Wow. Which was pretty impressive at the time. So yeah, fourth generation, but turns out on that side. So uh, went to UF and I, I did animal science, specialized in uh, 
deep cattle production because I, that's what I was familiar with and uh, it was part of my lifestyle. And then I decided I wasn't quite ready to leave Gainesville just yet. Uh, I had a few more football seasons in me, I thought. And so I, I decided to go to grad school and I actually uh, did an assistantship with Dr. Benjamini down at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center in Ona. And there I got the help of Dr. Benjamini's uh, research projects. I was able to complete a, a research project of my own looking at the hair grass and potassium levels. Um, and after that, the gentleman who had this position for me, Mr. Dennis Mudge, he was moving on to another spot. He encouraged me to apply for it. And like many uh, students out of college, I wasn't exactly sure what to do. So sure, I applied and I got the position. And, and here being able to take the education and experience that I have and then able to provide it back, give it back to the community the best that I can. That is awesome. And I have to say, I am jealous because UF has a really incredible animal and horticulture program. I have a lot of students that I've worked with here that came from there, and so I am very jelly. But um, so let's talk a little bit about the class that you teach here. Can you dive into the backyard chicken class a little bit? Sure. So the backyard chicken class was designed to be able to allow those people who live within uh, an area that has a direct past for backyard chickens in a residential area. The, the class was uh, usually installed so that way people who got into this backyard chicken uh, game, if you will, uh, had an idea of what they were getting themselves into before you know, they jumped in the first season and they noticed they were over, in over their heads. I required people to take the class and allowed the people who got who got the backyard chickens gave them an idea and a sense of what they were getting themselves into so that way maybe they could make a decision on whether or not they truly did want backyard chickens or not. So in the class uh, we, we teach, I teach a lot of things and before COVID um, I taught it in person. Um, I taught it both in Orange and Seminole County every other month and um, I would have 4-H uh, youth from Seminole County would come and bring their chickens so that way people could get hands-on chickens in, in their 4-H youth. And these are youth children who are seven, uh, seven to nine years old, and they're teaching adults how to hold chickens. So it was a great leadership program or leadership opportunity uh, for these 4-H youth, which is what 4-H is all about: is leadership. And so, mm -hmm. great opportunity for them. Uh, but we also focus on uh, nutrition, uh, talk about anatomy of the bird, some general anatomy stuff, and breeds. Uh, we talk about coop construction, uh, and we talk about biosecurity, uh, making sure that we keep everything as biosecure as possible when it comes to having these backyard chickens. Mm -hmm. So as you know, um, you know, a lot of conversations are being had right now because Orange County is considering passing an ordinance at large um, so that people in unincorporated Orange County can actually apply for a permit and then take your class um, in order to do backyard chickens. So I've heard a lot of you know, different myths and different facts that I wanted to kind of go through with you and hear your opinion based on all of your experience and maybe even some of the experiences of your students. Sure. So um, maybe tell me a little bit about the coop first. So let's talk about constructing a coop. Can I just take like DIY trash out of like the side of the road and construct some flimsy backyard ugly structure? Yeah, I mean, you can, but you wouldn't probably be falling in with the ordinance and it wouldn't be in your best interest to do that. Yeah. So in the class, we talk about coop construction. Uh, there's usually about six things we really look for when it comes to coop construction. Um, one of those things is gonna be, you wanna make sure it's it's secure because that's gonna be what protects your chickens from outside invaders, particularly raccoons. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, we're making sure we're building with sturdy materials such as um, hardware cloth, uh, if you use quarter inch hardware cloth, you can even eliminate snakes from possibly getting in there. Okay. So hardware cloth, woven wire, or steel welded wire. Mm -hmm. It has to be one of those three. I know a lot of people like to think they want to use chicken wire because it's called chicken wire, but the reason why it's called chicken wire is because it does a real good job at keeping chickens in it. It does a terrible job at keeping raccoons out. <laughs> Which I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, but yeah, that's why we teach it in the class, don't use chicken wire. Yeah, actually I have a quick funny story to share. I used to work out in Seminole County in their natural lands program and one time I went to go check on their chickens because they use them as kind of mosquito bait in order to see if there's any you know, diseases out in the natural lands areas. And one day I found a yellow rat snake 
that was completely incapacitated because it had like three or four eggs in its belly and I could pick it up and move it around and it just couldn't move because it was so full. Yep. So yeah, and sometimes we can find out what our invaders are because mm -hmm. exactly like that, they might get too full and they can't fit back through the wire that they've got in. So. Yeah. So their coop was not constructed the way that these coops in the backyard would be because they would be way smaller and way harder to get into. Yeah, generally speaking, especially if you use quarter inch hardware cloth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the other materials, you want to use any kind of any kind of wood that you have in contact with the ground. You're going to want to use pressure treated lumber usually because our soils here are just so uh, you know, consuming of anything that's carbon, including right. wood. So you want to use something that's going to try to last as long as possible. Also, when you're putting up that wire on the outside, you want to ask or suggest that you bury it uh, six to 12 inches in the ground, and if possible, kind of put it at an outside angle or flare at about 45 degrees. That way, any of our burrowing predators, uh, such as coyotes, can't burrow underneath. They do burrow underneath, they still just hit wire. And I've had some of my, uh, some people who have taken the class and got back with me said that whenever they dug their trench or so to put the wire in, they backfilled it with gravel. That way it's a little, the digging predators are less familiar with the gravel and it's a little less easy for them to get space because uh, it just kind of rolls back down to get together. So uh, that's another option that people can have as well. Is there a coop builder in this county um, that does it as a service? There are a couple of uh, carpenters or just general handymen that okay. actually do that kind of stuff. Um, there's no no one who just just does backyard chicken coops. There's a business model for you. Yeah. So, so I know I got a couple of people who do fence work and things like that. And they'll also get together and they'll work with you to go through the best what you're looking for. As well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So let's talk rats. Everybody is so scared of rats. And I'll tell you, in my years living in Florida, I've lived a lot of places all throughout Florida. I've seen rats in areas that have no chickens in sight. Maybe you can tell me, for those who are terrified of chickens because they think it's going to attract rats, what is that experience? So we have to look at the reason why are we, why would the chickens be attracting rats? Well, it's not that chickens, the rats aren't attracted to the chickens, there's nothing inherently interesting for the rats to the chickens. For the rats, maybe after uh, any excess feed that the chickens may have knocked on the ground or something like that. So the way we kind of address that is we have our feeders put up off the ground, not only does that make it a cleaner, cleaner environment for the birds because chickens love to scratch and throw feed everywhere when it's on the ground. So when we pick it up off the ground, it makes them less likely to scatter it around. Mm -hmm. So that way there's less likely for rats to want to even be there because again, all the rats are that chicken feed. And then a lot of the ordinances state that wherever you store your chicken feed in must be in a wood, a wood tight container, uh, a rodent proof container. Mm -hmm. That way the rats can't even get there to it. That way they have no interest. So the, 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 the chickens don't really attract the rats, it's just the chicken feed. When we address the chicken feed, we address the rats. Okay. okay. Um, so some of the other things that I heard about chickens during this experience of listening to some of the constituents who have said, you know, it's going to be so loud. You're going to hear every morning when the sun rises, chickens like screaming their heads off. <laughs> Do you have anything that you'd like to share about that? Sure. So. First, the, the notion of the chickens being loud in the morning, that's usually a pre-notion of roosters. Uh, roosters will crow not just in the morning, they'll crow at 3 o'clock in the morning. My neighbors will let you know. Yeah. Uh, but really, uh, all of our ordinances don't allow roosters. So roosters are forbidden, so we don't have those loud crowing birds. They're not allowed. Uh, but as far as the hens go, um, we uh, actually see, we've seen some data that state that chickens can range anywhere between 45 to 65 decibels, and um, I wanted to get some more hands-on uh, uh, and live experience with that with that information. So I worked with Orange County EPD, and they let me borrow one of their uh, decibel meters, and I got in contact with a couple of uh, backyard chicken keepers, and they allowed me to come over and actually use the meter and test to see how loud the chickens were. And uh, the first house we went to was at actually uh, was in downtown Orlando. We really couldn't get a good reading on them because there are so many, so much other background noises that we just couldn't focus on getting anything from the chickens because they had a neighbor or neighbor tuning our two doors down. They actually had a lawn, lawn care crew there and they were mowing and weed eating and things like that. And because they were, those, those instruments were so loud, we couldn't get, we couldn't get the chickens, honestly. And then whenever the weed crew, would, the lawn crew would stop, then they were on a corner lot. So cars passing by on those old 
the Lucas Town Brick Road in downtown. Uh, we couldn't hear it over that either. So um, the next house we went to, we were able to get a little bit more information, but uh, still with planes going overhead from the executive airport and things like that, it was difficult actually to get a, a reading on those chickens. And so uh, at, at the quietest way I could get them, I could get us and the loudest I could get them, I got them at about 55 decibels. Mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't exactly at their loudest point then, uh, but I can tell you that during the conversations that we have, kids were having with the homeowners and things like that, we were getting upwards of, of 65, I believe the 70 decibel range. What does that mean related to, like decibels? Like if I were to say my voice right now, what do you estimate my voice is? Right, so the conversation that we're having right now, again, it's pretty similar, similar to what was going on at that time. So I'd probably say this conversation is in the 60 to 63 range, 60, 63 decibel range. So we're louder than chickens. So we're louder than chickens at their average noise, yes. So chickens can get a little bit louder than that. They can get up to 65, uh, which is still well within a normal conversation range. Um, and the only time they're ever at that, that maximum noise level is whenever they'll be laying an egg, uh, that other than that, or if they're under distress. Mm -hmm. So if they're, if they are making a consistent amount of loud noise, then that's just a sign that the bird's probably being harassed by a nighttime predator, or it has other environmental stress, stressors going upon it. It's not a, it's not a common thing. They don't really make that much noise for that amount of, a mm -hmm. long amount of time. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I have a neighbor that's mad at my chickens. I could tell them that their landscaping people are louder than my chickens. Um, well, uh, more likely than not, yes, the, the lawn crew for sure will be louder than the chickens and they'll be loud, long, uh, louder for a longer amount of time. Mm -hmm. Again, so the chickens, again, while they might only get up to, they can get up to 65, they might get up to 65 decibels for maybe five minutes at most, mm -hmm. is the amount of time that it needs requires for it to pass an egg, mm -hmm. and, and that's really essentially it. Well, I'll tell you my favorite thing about this. I actually tried to do chickens illegally. I did not back before COVID. I thought that trade was going to slow down and that I was going to need eggs so desperately, so I made a DIY coop and I got four chickens, four hens, and I went over to Palmer's Feed Store and um, I didn't ask for any help or any advice and it all went wrong. So first off, raccoons came in very easily and got a hold of my chickens. Um, I didn't have any rat issues or any pest issues, but um, the, it, there was definitely issues with the coop not being stable and I, I wasted money and I wasted time. Now, I know that some people have brought up concerns about people maybe like putting chickens in an inhumane situation. And there was a beautiful point that was brought up that by having an ordinance, it's actually beneficial to make sure that people have a way to do things right. Because some people are gonna do things illegally, whether their neighbor calls on them or not. But making it more acceptable and more open for someone to come, go through the permitting process to make sure they don't waste time or money, and then actually sit with an expert who's taught how many classes now? Oof. Uh, I teach it monthly, and I've been teaching it monthly for roughly about four years, almost four years now. Wow. So you've definitely had a lot of experience that probably would have saved me money and sadness if I had done it the right way. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, I could have helped you out for sure. And that's exactly what my position is in this situation, is I'm strictly educational. So I'm here just to be able to help educate people in the methods that I specialize in, my stock natural resources, which the chickens fall under, so exactly like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a class every single month. I know you said it used to be in person, it's online, it probably will be in person again. How many students do you have per class, and uh, have, has anybody circled back to share their experiences with you? Yeah, so um, back uh, Pre-COVID, I was having in-person classes. I would average probably 20 to 25 people. Um, and again, I covered two counties, so I would hold one month in Orange County, one month in Seminole. So I was able to maintain those roughly 20, 25 numbers. Uh, once COVID hit, I had to, of course, switch everything to online, which took a little bit of time. But the first class that I got converted over uh, to Zoom was in May, and I had 
over 300 people attend that class, that first class. Wow. So, and then from the, the peak course had decreased after that, but it still was a substantial amount. So, since that period, um, I probably averaged about I probably averaged about 30 to 35 people in every class. And since teaching it online, was not, not used to anybody. I'm able to have more uh, interaction with participants, and as well as having interaction with uh, my coworkers. I actually have one of my uh, co-workers who's a livestock agent in Brevard County mm. who actually got his MS in poultry science. Wow. Um, I have him as my co-host and he's in the background fielding any questions that people type, type into the chat and or, or he also answers any questions that I might not be sure of because again he, he knows a little bit more about chickens than I do so mm. uh, that's why I chose him to come in there and help me with that. So yeah we average about uh, 30 to 35 I would say uh, participants uh, per month and granted because it is online some of those are from other nations and other states, but the good majority of it are still within here in Central Florida. That is such a good resource. So let's just break this down. I'm a constituent, I want to apply for a permit, and one of the obstacles that I have to overcome in order to even get the permit is that I have to take this class. I take the class, what do I expect the next day? You give us the tools to know where to buy the coop, you know, or the feed or the chickens, like how, how well, it, like what's the next few steps after somebody graduates from this class? Sure, so uh, after the class, uh, you'll get a certificate. Uh, so what we do offer, again, the live Zoom class, but I also have a Canvas course or an online class that you can just go take uh, whenever you, whenever you feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, that's an option as well. But once you complete the course, you'll get a certificate with your name and that's how the, the municipalities can see, okay, you passed, I'm gonna give you a permit, or you qualify for a permit now. Um, we do speak to some of the um, areas that, where you can purchase uh, birds. Uh, you know, we don't endorse anybody specifically, but we do list some of the locations where you can uh, have an idea of where to start. I think we do mention Palmer's in there, uh, as well as Hollows and a couple other places and around the counties uh, where people can go and start uh, you know, their process of looking at birds, getting in contact with people maybe who have coops uh, or construct coops and, and things of that nature as well. So yeah, you get some of those, uh, that information locations uh, from the class. I also, uh, have a while back, started a, a Google map, actually, an interactive Google map that, that lists some of the places where you can purchase birds, purchase bird material, feed, and, and coops, and things like that. Uh, and it's not a comprehensive map, because it's just one that I made. So uh, I always encourage people, if they have someone they like that, or some place, that they would like me to add to that map, just reach out to me, and I'd be happy to add it to the map, and people can access that from all around and check it out. That's awesome. So may, maybe let me know after this, let's say somebody starts with their backyard chickens and they start to see their chickens sick or acting weird. Do you have a, a way for them to continue to ask questions? Oh, absolutely. Uh, people have my, uh, my email address uh, whenever they take the class. It, it's, it's in my header. So they can always contact me via the email address. They get uh, contact here at the extension office. They can call here and reach out to me that way as well. Um, we also mentioned some of the stuff in there as well in the class. We talk about, again, biosecurity. So we talk about some of the, while there's not many truly common diseases, or, or backyard chickens aren't commonly affected with diseases, we do list some of the diseases that would be common if it were to happen mm -hmm. to our backyard flocks. And so we list, uh, we talk about what those look like, mm -hmm. what the uh, signs and symptoms could be. And we also mention about, uh, we have a really great resource here in Central Florida, the Charles Bronson Animal Diagnostic Laboratory right over in the St. Cloud Kissimmee area. Uh -huh. And it's a, it's a state-of-the-art animal diagnostics laboratory. And so if you ever have any concerns or issues like that, you're sure feel free to contact me and I can help you as well. But if it comes down to actually having to take some bacterial test or a necropsy or something like that, the lab right over there isn't too far away and they have a really great program to be able to help you diagnose anything that you might not be sure about. Okay, awesome. So maybe tell us, you know, uh, any other last comments or thoughts or, or you know, any fears that you might have heard or misconceptions that you might have heard that you want to clear up. Um, and as far as the fears and misconceptions part, um, it's, it's largely just the, the noise element. Just uh, people are fear are afraid that it's going to make a lot of noise. Um, but uh, there are many places, uh, many people who have gotten, such as in the city of Orlando, they've gone forward and gotten backyard chickens. Because uh, those people have told me in the past, sometimes uh, their neighbors didn't even know they had chickens until they started bringing the neighbors started bringing the mates. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They weren't even aware that they were there, and 
Uh, that's that's kind of the only one, that one, and then the kind of the cleanliness uh, factor of it. Sometimes mm -hmm. some people might be under the impression that uh, whenever you allow a backyard chicken situation that you're going to allow chickens to just run all over the place. And um, uh, that's not necessarily, uh, it depends on the ordinance and how it's written, but I know that we're working on to make that uh, a deal with the Cleveland Orange County that the chickens are required to be kept within their coop. So that way you don't have that situation of them um, you know, hopping the fence and going into your neighbor's yard and causing issues like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're trying to address those things. Other than that, um, no, I, I will throw in a little tidbit. You asked uh, earlier what might be about, I can talk a little bit about my experience with birds and uh, or with chickens. Um, and I'll say that as a matter of fact, uh, I'm actually terrified of birds, <gasps> including chickens. Really? It I, I am, yeah. And it all comes out. Yeah. Well, just look at them, act like they're dogs. I think of them more as like dinosaurs, little dinosaurs. Little, little dinosaurs. Down, really. uh, I don't know exactly what, what why that is. I think mm -hmm. I can trace it back to some childhood trauma, possibly, with mm -hmm. a rooster and some cousins and, and spurs and things like that. Yes, um, but I for whatever see. reason, I really don't do well with birds, so I really appreciate it when the 4-H youth bring their chickens and demonstrate and show to class participants because it's not only a really good opportunity for them to develop leadership skills, but it also gets me off the hook and not having to deal with birds yeah, as well. Yeah, you get to stand so, in the back. And take great pictures. Yeah. That There's no shame in that, you know? Like, a lot of people have fears. I have a very irrational fear of moths and sometimes butterflies, and I'll tell you why. Totally random story. But I was, I was washing my dog one day and there was a really bad drought and an entire tree full of like moths and butterflies came at me and started swarming us. And ever since then, as a child, if they fly too close to me too quick and I don't expect it, I just freak out. <laughs> so there are fears that we can all accept that we all have. But you know, I do love that a lot of people say that they get their kids to be a part of the chicken raising responsibility because A, it gets the kids outside, which that is valuable. Uh, kids have phones in their faces all day and it gives them kind of responsibilities, you know, it gives them a reason to kind of have something on their list of things to do and that they can be proud of themselves. Certainly, and when we talk, when we give the class, one of the first slides we talk about are the reasons why you might want to have backyard chickens because it's a fairly it's a fairly popular topic and so some people may just have heard it and may think it clash with that of curiosity and one of the reasons why we list is a, a really great teaching tool for the youth mm -hmm. uh, teaching them about biology about life and death and having responsibilities and things of that nature and that kind of ties into the 4-h program because I, I also kind of plug that in there a little bit because they can also the, the youth can also take these chickens that they have in their backyards and show them at different 4-h shows and exhibitions and actually make it into a kind of a competitive event for the, both the bird and the, the child. Mm -hmm. so. No, that's awesome. Now, I will tell you that back when I was doomsday prepping when COVID hit, I had no idea what was coming. Um, I converted my entire front and side and backyard into edible gardens. And the chicken poop was like gold because our soil here in Florida is not very good. And having something that can your soil and that you can use you know and make teas in order to amend your soil it was a really beneficial thing for the gardening experience mm -hmm. um, I think however this case you're not allowed to make chicken tractors per many of the ordinances correct so yeah a lot of our uh, ordinances allow for a or require a permanent structure to yes. be built because in a lot of our a lot of the areas where this ordinance will be uh, focusing on uh, it's a real tight, tight area, not, not very big lots usually. So to try to avoid any kind of issues with uh, moving the chickens around and then deforaging almost the entire backyard, things like that, we're just mm -hmm. focusing on these permanent structures because the chicken tractors are a little bit more useful in larger areas than what our residential areas usually have. Yeah. Um, so another thing that I did wrong with my chickens was that I got the wrong kind of chicken. I got a show chicken that I guess is just a little hen that's just really, really cute and is not very productive. Now, is there a specific type of chicken that has really good high protein like eggs that, you know? Uh, well, not specifically. Uh, eggs are for the most part eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a little bit of a difference in 
kind of what you feed them could have a small difference on the nutritional value of the okay. egg, okay. but it's it's real, real minor. Uh, but when it comes to egg production, what breed of chicken you get plays a big factor into what how many what size egg you get. So usually when we talk about breeds of chickens, there are pretty well two categories. Those are broilers, and broilers are our meat production birds, mm -hmm. and then we have layers, and layers are our egg production birds. And so whenever you go to select a bird, you look for layer varieties. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily purebred or exhibition show varieties, like maybe you did. Mm -hmm. uh, so you look for those layer varieties, um, and there's several out there. It's hard to really name just one that's the best of all. Um, you know, our white leghorns are our, our commercial standard. Maybe we get our, our most of our commercial eggs from because they are really good layers. Mm -hmm. We also have others like Rhode Island Reds, uh, of pork and fin that are pretty well. Um, so it's just a matter of what you like and, and you know what, what what you're looking for. So I really don't like to say what breed people should get because it's kind of like telling somebody what kind of car they should get. You know, it depends on what you're going to be using it for, and it depends on your personal preferences. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you can also choose based uh, your breed based upon what color of egg you want because egg color is entirely dependent upon what the breed of the bird is. And you can kind of make a little bit of a prediction because uh, chicken earlobes actually correlate with the color of egg that they're going to lay. And so uh, you can kind of predict and guess what color egg they're going to lay by looking at the color of their earlobe. You just blew my mind. I never thought I never thought you could do that. No. That's fascinating. So um, so of course, you know, they a, a graduate of this, you know, the certified um, person who leads this class, they're going to get that list and they're going to see the differences and they're going to kind of better understand. Now, do you recommend that people get chicks over the actual chickens? I don't, adults? Yeah, I don't really make it a recommendation. I tell you, I, we go through the entire process. So if you choose to get chicks, you know, we start, we start in the very beginning. If you choose to get fertilized eggs, we mm -hmm. talk, we start with the incubator and explain what an incubator oh, is and what it does. I see. Okay. How often you turn the eggs, things like that, and then we talk about hatching and how important it is to let the birds and chicks hatch themselves out. Don't help them because you know you might want to help them and see that they're you think they're struggling, but really what they're doing is they're aligning all their ligaments and joints properly because they've been crammed up inside that eggshell for the last 21 or so days. So mm -hmm. making sure they move around and get it all off themselves is important. And then we talk about moving into the brooder, which is where you'll have those chicks and kind of grow them up as they go through that transitionary growing phase. Um, and then we talk about moving them into the coop. And so I don't really recommend one or the other. It just depends upon the person and what kind of, what they're really looking for. If they're just looking to get eggs today, they can go get some laying hens now and, and get those eggs. If they're looking, you know, if they've got some uh, small children that they want to teach and explain them about you know, the life cycle and things like that, definitely can go get uh, getting some chicks and that way you can be able to teach them uh, that as well. So mm -hmm. whatever the person's preferred. Mm -hmm. Or you could get a show bird and, you know, brush its feathers and make it look really pretty. Maybe teach it how to play a song on the piano and then maybe you can win some money somewhere at some, like, festival. Yeah, I don't have that listed as an option, but I suppose it's one for sure. Awesome. Well, so in closing, like maybe tell us some other classes and some other opportunities that are offered here. Okay, sure. So, like I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, you have this extension. We're we're always teaching stuff. There's always something going on. So, uh, here in Orange County, uh, we have several different. Uh, I can't even begin to list all the classes that we offer. Um, we have uh, residential uh, residential garden uh, residential horticulture agents. So they teach vegetable classes, uh, vegetable garden classes, herb classes. I think sometimes he teaches a, a pepper class, a hot pepper class. Uh, we teach composting classes. Uh, we have demonstration gardens. You can come by and take a look and see at some of what we've got growing out here and look at all the different things that are in season right now. Uh, we have landscape, uh, landscape, <laughs> landscape classes where you can learn about different how to, uh, different things going on in your landscape. If you're trying to, uh, you know, trim your palms ideally or great myrtles or what kind of turf grass is better for your soil or your area. We have agents who teach those kinds of classes. Uh, personally, because I'm livestock and natural resource, I teach chicken class, backyard chicken class, but I also teach a, a beekeeping classes as well, which I just uh, did this morning and yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. beekeeping classes as well. Um, I do a lot of pasture visits, so people who have uh, horses in the backyard, or if they have actual production, livestock production, cattle or horses and that, 
Uh, I'm always happy to take a visit out there, look at the poisonous plant, talk about their behavior or the, their, their pasture production, see what we can do to try to increase that and make better livestock, make better production, have more food, healthier people. Um, I'm teaching a bat house building class in August as well. Um, I also help train people for Lake Watch volunteers. So Lake Watch is a program that UF does or helps coordinate uh, where citizens can just volunteer to take water samples of lakes that they have access to and they can send those lake samples up to Gainesville where they test it and they continually test it on a roughly monthly, monthly basis. So we're able to measure the uh, nutrient loads within that lake. So we can see whenever we see spikes, we can you know, contact the proper you know, authorities for the county or city and see, hey, we got something going on here. Um, that's a really cool thing because it's made up of citizens who just have an interest in measuring their lake water. Um, and so I train people for that as well. Um, yeah, so we always got something going on here at the Extension Office. Um, and then FCS, I didn't talk about FCS stuff. So, uh, making sure we have uh, surf safe classes, we have money, uh, first time homeowner, uh, first time home buyer classes, uh, we have fitness classes, uh, we have diet, diet classes for those on a low budget or, or elderly folk. I mean, we just have everything going on here at the Extension Office. And it's not just Orange County, but all counties, because again, we have an uh, office in each of the 67 counties here in the state of Florida. That's awesome. Do you have a plug, like um, either social media or an email, that if people want more information, they can sign up? Yeah, so uh, we're on, I think, pretty well on all social media sites, except for, I don't think we have a TikTok yet, but... Oh, you need to get on your TikTok uh, game. I'm, I'm kind of old man yelling at the sky. Yes. I'm not quite there at TikTok yet. But yeah, we have OCF, OCFL Extension. Uh, it's usually, I think, most of our, uh, it's our app for most of our uh, social media. Um, so, yeah, OCFL Extension. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I hope after this, people will feel encouraged to reach out. Um, you can also email district1 at ocfl.net if you have any questions or you'd like to get connected to the team here. And I just want to encourage everyone to, you know, kind of do your own research. Um, you know, take advantage of these incredible resources that are right here nestled in our community and um, definitely send us any comments or questions that you might have. We very much value and appreciate you and your time. Uh, do we have any questions? No? All right, well, thank you so much. Any closing words? Uh, go Gators. <laughs> go Gators. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, thank you all so much.